And so the firstborn son always received the double inheritance because the land, of course, is very important to Israel. And it's very important to God that Israel inherit the land that God gave them. And so this is the plan for it, that if a, a son took a wife, and if the firstborn son were to take a wife, then if his wife were to die, I'm sorry, not his wife, if he were to die, then that daughter still had a claim on the inheritance that would have been her husband's, and that claim would be that her child, or that that, that family owed her the right to bear a child from that family that would carry on that inheritance, that would receive that double portion inheritance. And so what would happen would be the second son would be obligated to marry that daughter. Now the problem with Naomi is she had two sons and both of them died. The second problem was this. They had been married for about 10 years, Mahlon and Chilion had, before they died. And so Orpah and Ruth would have been 10 years into marriage, obviously would not have been terribly young. Say they were 15, uh, which co could have been a possibility at this time, and their husbands had died. They would have been young enough that if a second son were born, it would be possible for them to marry a son. It would be by a stretch possible, I should say, to marry a new son if, uh, if his mother and father had another child. What's the problem with that? problem is Naomi's husband died. doesn't look like she's going to be having any more children. And both of her children are dead, and so she doesn't have a son to offer. And so she gives a very generous offer, if you will, to her daughters, and that is this. I'm going to release you from an obligation to be part of, of the family of Elimelech and allow you to stay here in Moab and seek, go to the homes of your fathers. You're still young enough that you could probably find a husband and, and bear children, and your children could have an inheritance. You could have a future that way. Now, Naomi goes back to Bethlehem. Well, well Ruth... Uh, Ruth and Orpah both said, no, we'll go back with you. And she says, no, I insist you go home. And Ruth said, please don't ask me to leave. She says, I will go back with you. And she says, my God will be your God, and my pe your, or your God will be my God, and your people will be my God. In other words, she chose the God who is the God of all living, that is Jehovah God, and uh, she chose to have a relationship with Him. Now keep in mind, and, and I, I went through all this to remind you of something that's very important that occurs in the passage of Scripture we look at this evening. And keep in mind this, Ruth made a decision to be desolate when she chose the God of the nation of Israel. When Ruth chose to go home with Naomi, she chose to go home with a woman who had no future to a home uh, where she was going to commit to being a part of a family that had no kinsman redeemer. If Ruth had committed herself for the rest of her life to have for her family Jehovah God and her mother-in-law, Naomi. I want you to think about that just for a moment. She had committed for the rest of her life to God that she was not only willing, but expected to never have a husband and never to bear children. I don't know if the full import of that would strike you, but I'm telling you, this, this young lady felt that the God of Israel was good enough for her. She felt that all her needs would be met in Jehovah God, and not only felt that, but she committed to that with her life. And I want to tell you something. By man's view, by man's way of thinking, she didn't have any prospects. It wasn't like, well, I'm going to go back to Israel and see what the boys look like there. So I'm going to go back to the nation of Israel, Naomi, and I am going to make God the only person in my life that is, or the person in my life who is sufficient to meet all my needs, physical and spiritual. She goes home, and here, her and Naomi come back, and Naomi, and the people said, is this Naomi? And Naomi means, uh, means full or pleasant, means pleasant, things are good. And uh, she said, don't call me pleasant, don't call me Naomi. She says, call me Mara, which means bitter. She says, because I went out full, and I came back empty. She says, I left here with a husband and two sons, and it looked as though I had a future. And I came back with no future at all. Uh, friend, I have to say to you, this is encouraging for me. You ever been at a time in your life when you felt as though you came to a place where you just, it seemed as though the old phrase we would use would be, you hit rock bottom as though you're at a place 
when there ain't no going lower. Hey, you're at a place when the only, I mean, you may not be able to look up, but there ain't no way you can look down because you're at the bottom. And that's the way Naomi felt. And from man's perspective, I could see the people going, boy, poor Naomi, that is true. Boy, she left and all she got, all she, she left with a son, or two sons and a husband, and she came back with a Gentile daughter-in-law. Now, futures there and that. Who in Israel is going to want to marry a Moabitess? Well, then there's this man named Boaz. And here is the story. Ruth uh, says to her mother-in-law, they're poor. And uh, they, of course, they would have had Elimelech's land, but it would not have been tilled, and it would not have been in a position to produce any kind of crops. And the law in the nation of Israel was that there was a provision for the poor in every field. Everyone who uh, harvested a harvest uh, had a provision for us. Somebody, somebody tell me what that was. What, was. what were the ways that the poor were taken care of? Yes, sir. Well, they weren't supposed to go over the uh, olives twice. They were supposed to, if they forgot a sheep in the field, they were supposed to leave it there. They, were, they weren't supposed to clean up all the wheat. And uh, they were uh, not supposed to go over the grapes twice. Okay, so here, here's what Brother Chris is saying. The corners of the field, when they're out gleaning and they were, and they were with a scythe or whatever they would have used at those times when they were cutting uh, the wheat, uh, when they come to a corner, they round it off. And they went around a corner and they left that corner uncut. And if, they, if while they're winnowing or they're, or they're cutting, uh, they, some, uh, some of the grain doesn't get cut. Maybe their tool's not as sharp as it should be and, and some gets left there. They're not allowed to go back and get it. When it came to the olive trees and the fig trees, uh, it, when they would shake the trees and make the olives fall out, the ones that weren't yet ripe would stay up in the trees. And when those ripened, they weren't allowed to go back for them. They got to shake the trees one time. And when they shook their trees, if whatever they got for that harvest, that was what they got from the trees. So whatever wasn't ripe was for the poor. Whatever was left in the corners of the field was for the poor to glean. And if they're picking up their sheaves and they accidentally dropped one or they're carrying them into the field and one drops down, when it fell on the ground, there was a law that said you couldn't pick it up. And that was a provision for the poor. Now, it's interesting that this provision for the poor gave something for free, but those individuals would have to glean it just like anyone else. And so the poor didn't just uh, come when the bread was made and get free bread. They had to go get in the field. And they had to work for it like anyone else did. And the reason they were poor was not because they were lazy or not because of, you know, the uh, bad choices that they made by the way with they lost everything. The reason they were poor was usually because they didn't have an inheritance. And so maybe they would have a trade or something, but there would be times of the year when they wouldn't have anything to eat. And so they had the right to go into the vineyards and they had the right to go into the olive, uh, into the uh, olive, what were they calling uh, Olive groves. Um, they had the right to harvest the leftovers and that was the inheritance of the poor. And God loved the poor, and so he wrote into the law of the nation of Israel a way to, pre to take care of them. Well, Boaz is a man of great wealth. He was a mighty man of wealth, as the scripture would say. Now, it's, it's interesting. He was the son of Rahab the harlot. And uh, so he has kind of, if you will, a God has mightily blessed him. He's very wealthy, and he has a wonderful reputation in the nation of Israel, but he's got a little bit of a shady background, if you will. He's, he doesn't come from the right pedigreed family. If you will, Boaz is a fella. Uh, whose mother chose God, and her faith was counted her for righteousness, and she became, uh, she, God became her God, much the same way that Ruth uh, chose God. And this, so it would be the same kind of a story. And here's Boaz, who would have had a mother that I believe would have been a very godly example for him, and whom the Lord had mightily blessed, and God had taken care of. And so he has a great inheritance, and he's a good prospect for gleaning in his field. And so Ruth goes out, and she finds a really good place to glean, and so she's out with the maidens, of uh, Boaz, and she's gleaning in the field, and he notices her. And we looked at this story last week, so we don't have the opportunity uh, to go over it all the way, but she works all day long, and, and Boaz discovers her, not all day, but for months, actually, because she worked through, both through the wheat harvest and the barley harvest. And so she is working for, and Boaz notices her and gives her permission uh, to, she says, don't go to any other fields. You stay here, and you eat with with, uh, with my maidens, and I'll take care of the things that you need. And so he said, it's been told me what you did for Naomi, the way that you have chosen to stick with Naomi and be faithful to her, even though there's nothing in the world that she could offer you. And Boaz is impressed by this young lady, Ruth. By the way, folks, can I say this to you? And I would say this in particular to individuals that would be seeking.